Well, greetings out there on YouTube land and welcome to today's big video which will feature the contents of this box. So without further ado, let's get it open and see what we'll be working with for the next few days. And here we have a Fender Baseman uh, amplifier uh, and judging from the serial number and a little interpolation, I believe it came from around the middle of May in 1962. As a result, it will have the brown face. We'll look at that uh, closer in just a second. With the little white muffin uh, style knobs. And it came in a uh, blonde cabinet. Okay, let's uh, take a look here uh, at the components that are attached to the chassis. We see that the power transformer has been replaced. But the filter choke and massive output transformer are original. Not much else that we can tell from here. You see a wee bit of heat, um, which is typical in your output tubes. See that uh, only one of the uh, 6L6s has got the little uh, bear trap uh, tube base holder. Also, you can see that this chassis also was used for the basement that had a tube rectifier. Uh, they've covered the hole here. I guess they had some of these uh, uh, tube rectifier uh, chassis at, around and didn't want to waste them. So they made a little plate, put it there, and then put the uh, customary uh, three diodes and three diodes in series and um, went with the solid state rectification. Um, that's about it here on the top end. We'll open the doghouse in just a minute. We see that it's kind of typical. You see that the output transformer is tilted because the box was dropped uh, on its end at some time or other and therefore the uh, momentum of the transformer and the mass of it caused it to continue after the bottom stopped and bend. Okay, uh, I'm going to straighten that out. I don't like the looks of it. Okay, let's flip it over and take a look at the front, back, and interior. As expected, it has the uh, brown face with a couple little scratches and rub marks, but overall in pretty darn good shape. Okay, now let's take a look at the rear panel. And here's the rear panel. It looks about the same, maybe a little better. Uh, thank God there's no extra holes drilled or any... Uh, harm uh, that's been inflicted on it. This looks like a more modern uh, cap for the fuse holder and thank heavens it has the highly regarded approved for electrical safety sticker from Los Angeles, California. Okay, I mean uh, the un underwriter laboratory sticker pales by comparison. So there it is and we know we'll be safe when working on it as a result. Of that sticker. Okay, uh, let's take a look inside the uh, chassis at the circuit. We see that uh, the interior of the chassis is in pretty good shape. Uh, been some corrosion, uh, but overall um, it has been molested, but it was gentle and it was probably after uh, at least three dates. Um, the replacement power transformer and this is, you may think this is unusual. We have two um, filter caps here in our uh, negative DC bias supply, but we're going to see that's going to narrow down the identification of this circuit. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Meanwhile, let's see here. The pots appear to be original. We see that the cathode bypass caps have been replaced, but thank heavens the blue molded uh, capacitors, which are almost always in good shape and also very highly respected uh, for tone are intact. Thank heavens. Okay, looking around here, uh, I don't see any resistors that are jumping out at me as being roasted. I see that we have screen resistors, but we don't have grid blockers. Um, we're going to have them, though. I always put those in. I think it's a good idea. And and I can't believe that the um, California Electrical Safety Board didn't pick up on the death cap there. They let this one slip by, but we're not going to do that. That'll be removed. Uh, it looks like we've already had a three-wire power cord installed. We'll see if we agree with how it's wired. 
I think odds are we won't. Uh, but um, overall, looks like a good example of the species. So uh, let's get started and see if we can't make this jewel sing like or even better than the day it was made. Now according to the literature, uh, there are three different circuits used in this particular model of the basement. The 6G6, the 6G6A, and surprisingly enough, the 6G6B. Now if you recall, I said the dual filter caps here uh, give us a hint about the uh, identity of this circuit. Let's look here at the 6G6 and you'll see that there are two 8 microfarad at 150 volt uh, parallel caps. On the 6G6A we have the same 8 and 8 but on the 6G6B it's a single 25 at 50. So the 6G6B schematic goes back in the file and let's focus then on the 6G6 and 6G6A to narrow it down between the 6G6 and the 6G6A the difference is as obvious as the nose on Jimmy Durante's face the 6G6 is the one that used the tube rectifier and since the hole for the tube rectifier it has been covered with a plate. We know that this is a 6G6A because of the triple, triple diode rectification. So, put the 6G6 uh, schematic back in the file and from now on we'll be referring to this particular schematic while working on the circuit. Now let's take a few moments to discuss the peculiarities of the 6G6A circuit and believe me there are several. First off let's look at the base channel and we see that there are four triodes prior to the long tail pair phase inverter whereas in the normal channel there are only two triodes. So uh, the base channel is going to have twice as many stages of preamplification. Uh, I don't recall ever seeing that in any other uh, amplifier circuit. But because the stages of preamplification are 4 and 2, both even numbers, the two channels are in phase and can be jumpered. Unlike the younger brother, uh, the AA864 circuit, in which there are three triodes in the base channel and two triodes in the normal channel, and you cannot jumper the two channels. Now let's look at another oddity. Look at the tone stack here for the normal channel, and it looks pretty customary. We have the bass and treble in between the two triodes of preamplification. Look at the tone stack here for the bass channel. We see that we have a bass tone control not between two triodes but between two duo triodes of preamplification and the treble control is just before the uh, signal passes on to the long tail pair. This is extremely unusual okay, to uh, arrange the tone uh, stack in this manner and uh, should yield, as we will see in the audio demonstration, a difference in gain between the two channels and I would think a difference in tone response between the two channels. But regardless of which channel we are plugged into, uh, the signal will enter the customary um, long tail pair phase inverter using a 7025 tube. And that signal will be fed without the benefit of grid blocker resistors into the 5881, not 6L6GC, but 5881 
output tubes. Now granted, they are closely related, very similar, but in the 6 G6A, Fender does specify 5881s. That signal then will be output through that massive output transformer to two 12-inch speakers. About the only other observation I'd make here is the way the reservoir capacitors are configured. And we know that in later model uh, basement amps, the reservoir capacitors are installed in series and the 70 and 70 microfarads will give us, because of the unusual interaction between series capacitors, 35 microfarads at 700 volts. Okay, um, whereas in the 6, uh, G6A they are in parallel which will give us 40 microfarads at 600 volts. Um, it's a small difference, but still, um, I try to highlight all the different design uh, principles in these circuits. And it will help you interpret schematics and also just understand the architecture of the circuits as we proceed. Now, before we begin our overhaul of the uh, circuit, Let's take one last uh, observation here uh, under the doghouse and we see that on the lid is a rather contradictory stamp. The serial number dating site, not to be confused with the serial killer dating site, states categorically that uh, based on the serial number of this chassis, this amp was made around May of 1962. Yet we see this January 63 stamp. When confronted with this type of uh, conflict here, I tend to go with the rubber stamp. I can't imagine anybody in May of 1962 saying, hey, I'm going to play a little trick on uh, some the poor schmo who tries to fix this thing. And uh, let's just put uh, January of 63 uh, on the cover of the doghouse just to create some sort of uh, confusion and uh, consternation or constipation. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm tempted to believe this personally, but who cares, okay? We still need to fix the amp. So let's take a look inside and we see that a nice set of what appear to be fairly new, if not brand new, F and T filter caps have been installed in in good form and that the internodal resistors look like they're in beautiful shape. Naturally we'll have to test them. But uh, for now it we may, if these all check out okay, be able to leave this part intact and save the customer some money. Our assignment on this amp based on the email that was sent to me uh, by the owner is uh, primarily that the plate current in the output tubes seems quite low. Um, now, it, my experience tells me when that happens, as long as there is nothing uh, hindering the performance of the power transformer, it's probably due to depleted cathodes in an old kind of semi-worn out set of output tubes. So I think we're going to order a nice matched pair of output tubes and I'm going to go with 6L6GCs um, for this particular uh, application and I've already placed the order. We'll have to wait a few days for them to arrive. Uh, the other things uh, that he mentioned were that he thought that the primary cord had probably been wired incorrectly and from what I've seen he's right. Also, he wants the negative feedback loop installed uh, in lieu of the polarity switch, which is uh, useless uh, with a three-wire power cord. And, of course, a thorough review of all the components uh, in the amplifier circuit to make sure they're within spec and functioning properly, replacing those that aren't. So, with that in mind, uh, I think it's time for us to get started. 
We caught Jack talking on the phone the other day, and about two days later, a giant box showed up, and he had ordered himself a Kitty Taj Mahal, which, of course, I had to assemble. But here he is, surveying his kingdom from one of his many balconies. Let's start off here with the polarity switch. We see that uh, whoever installed the three-wire power cord wired the polarity switch into the circuit uh, with the death cap. Okay, well, to me, this is wrong on so many levels. So I'm going to undo uh, their work here and rewire it uh, in the way that I think is best with the elimination of the death cap. All right, I've rewired the primary circuit, uh, completely separated the polarity switch from that circuit. I uh, brought in the three leads and soldered a terminal strip to the chassis and then to the lug that was soldered to the chassis I brought in the green ground wire. Black then goes to the switch, white then goes uh, into one of the primary windings of the uh, power transformer. Now let's focus on uh, changing out the 470 ohm screen resistors and installing 1500 ohm grid blockers. All right, the output tube uh, sockets are finished. Uh, here is the 470 ohms, uh, the screen resistors. Uh, you're wondering why I put the red insulation? Because there's a screw that protrudes up here, and if this drooped down a little bit, you'd have a dead short in your screen circuit, which would probably be the end of your power transformer. Um, so you always double check and imagine worst case scenario uh, what could happen and how you could prevent it from happening. Uh, here are the grid stoppers. Uh, to work properly, grid stoppers have to be as close as possible to the um, grid uh, lug or pin here. So as you can see, uh, what do we have? Maybe a quarter inch of lead before we go directly into the grid on both of them. Uh, these are used to uh, stop like parasitic oscillations and uh, other such catastrophic events um, and they're definitely worth having. Now our next task is one I failed to mention earlier in the video and that is that the owner of the amp requested an adjustable bias pot. Now 6G6 series uh, Fender amps do not have it. Uh, the bias is fixed with the 56k resistor in that position but on the uh, next model, the AA864, they do have an adjustable bias pot. It's a 10k linear pot that feeds uh, varying amounts of the negative DC bias up here to the grids of the output tubes. But the problem with the fender design is if anything interrupts the uh, connection between the wiper and the resistive perimeter, the inside of the pot, uh, you have no negative DC bias, which means the tubes then will start red plating, run away, and just self-destruct. So this is not really the hot setup. Uh, Marshall actually came up with a better plan, and I have uh, designed a circuit for this amp that's uh, similar to the Marshall now here's how uh, it's going to be wired and how it will function. Bottom lug of the 50k pot will go to ground. Middle lug is the wiper. It will also go to ground. Upper lug will be connected to a 22k resistor that will connect to this junction. Now at this junction the negative DC bias supply will be sent here and it will have two choices. If the uh, wiper has been cranked all the way down here to the bottom of the 50K uh, pot, then there's a great deal of resistance, 72K of resistance. The negative DC bias supply will then go to the grids and uh, greatly uh, reduce the bias level. Uh, plate current will go way down. If, however, we've adjusted our wiper up to this point, then the negative DC bias supply encounters a 22K route to ground, which is very low resistance, 
and almost all of it will go that way and send almost nothing up here to the grids to uh, moderate the plate current and as a result the plate current will go way up so by adjusting this pot we can adjust the amount of negative DC bias supply sent to the grids and therefore the bias of the tube now why you may ask is this vastly superior to the fender uh, circuit uh, we remember that I said if the wiper contact was interfered with or or lost then nothing uh, goes up to the tube grids to suppress plate current tubes then will start red plating and eventually just self-destruct look here though if the wiper is lost uh, the contact is lost we have a fixed 72 K resistance to ground which is rather high for this circuit so that means that the DC uh, um, bias voltage then is going to go to the grids in a much higher level and effectively shut them down and protect them from damage. To hold the bias pot rigidly in the chassis, and it has to be because you just can't have it flopping around in here and grounding, uh, I've made this bracket that will hold the potentiometer out here uh, up from the chassis surface and out of harm's way and it will be held down with a transformer nut at this end. Let's go ahead and install the pot and wire it up and see if it works. Okay here's our uh, bias pot securely installed uh, in the chassis now it's time to wire it. Okay it's all wired in uh, you see that the end lug and the uh, wiper are grounded. I soldered the end of the chassis to be sure that it could never come loose. Got our 22K uh, resistor coming over here to tie into the negative DC bias supply. Before I connect it though, we're going to test to make sure this works uh, as we hope it does. And uh, I'm going between ground and that input end uh, from the bias supply and we predicted a range of 22k to 72k let's see as we adjust it through its full sweep what our actual measurements are okay we're fully clockwise and that's our hottest bias position we have 22k ohms to ground so the vast majority of our negative DC bias supply is going to ground now let's start cranking counterclockwise and we see our resistance increase wow right on the money well tiny bit high 73.3k ohms now that gives us a really nice sweep below and above the 56k that the amp came with plus it's fully adjustable we don't have to remove resistors and uh, do trial and error replacing them okay so I uh, pronounce this a success uh, let's finish the wiring and then move on to our next task now that we've completed the adjustable bias control let's move on to the switchable NFB loop using the polarity switch that has been separated from the circuit here we see the negative feedback loop coming out of the secondary of the output transformer uh, with a 56k resistor and then coming down here to the long tail pair we look inside uh, the amplifier circuit and we see this wire coming from the uh, secondary of the output transformer down here to the 56k resistor what we're going to do then is insert the polarity switch in series with that wire that way you can either switch on or off the negative feedback all right I removed that uh, negative feedback wire from the secondary of the output transformer I added an extension to it and I'm going to route it over here to this end of the polarity switch the wire is connected to this lug on the polarity switch and now we will connect a wire from the bottom of the two lugs the bottom one back over here to the output jack where 
this wire was originally connected. And now the final wire in the NFB loop has been connected to the polarity switch and has been routed under the steel rail back right here to the uh, connection to the secondary of the output transformer. Now our NFB loop is switchable. Time to power up the amp for the first time and check for any issues. I've got a pair of old 6L6s uh, with the Eurotubes probes uh, in series. I'm inputting a 200 cycle per second tone into the base channel. All the controls are at zero and I'm connected to the 12 inch workshop speaker. Let's turn on the power and give it a minute to warm up before we take it off of standby. Oh, and one last thing, I also have the bias uh, control to absolute maximum cold for starters. Then we're going to crank it up uh, and see what our uh, plate dissipation is on this old pair of tubes uh, that I've uh, installed. Okay, we're switching off a of standby and we can see that our tubes are slowly warming up and are way low on plate current which is to be expected with the bias pot set at maximum cold. Okay, now let's crank up the bias uh, and see if we can get these tubes to perform at a proper level. Okay, that's max on the bias pot and they're still a little cool but a whole lot better than they were. Now let's see how it sounds. Sounds great. Uh, turn up the treble, get a little increased gain. Bass, we get a little more, but we have a good clean now this volume is with the NFB on. Let's switch it off and see what happens. Wow. Substantial increase in gain. Uh, we'll evaluate that when we're doing our audio testing, but I can tell you right now that NFB switch is working just fine. Fortunately, our brand new set of matched 606 GCs uh, just arrived from Antique Electronic Supply, so let's open it up and plug them in and see how well they're balanced and if we can get them biased at a proper level. And here are the new tubes I've ordered. Um, I've had really good luck with these Tube Amp Doctor 606GCM-STR uh, tubes. Uh, they're the red base and uh, you get a six month warranty with them which uh, should cover you know any um, early problems with them in the first few months I think after that time you're pretty safe so let's go ahead and plug these in and uh, get about uh, biasing this amp properly okay our tubes are warmed up let's take the amp off standby and recall I had the pot set uh, where the maximum amount of negative DC is going to the grids. Let's crank it up and lower the negative DC. And let's see, it looks like we're at about 16.8. But bear in uh, mind that this is using the current limiter. Uh, now let's plug it into the wall and see uh, what kind of bias we get. Here we go from current limiter to AC supply. We'll go back on with our power and we'll come off a of standby in uh, just a, oh, a fraction of a minute. Okay, we're off a of standby. I turned the bias pot down and now we can crank it to raise our plate dissipation and there's not a huge difference. It went up a small amount which tells us that the current limiter was really not lowering the current or voltage supply that much. Okay, so we're still now, we're at about 17 
six or something like that, but what a nice match we have. Okay, so 17-6. Uh, let me go ahead and figure this out uh, accurately, and then we'll figure our next move. Here are the values for plate current and plate voltage. Plate dissipation, about 17.6, as I estimated, and 18 watts. We know that uh, that's going to be around 60% of the maximum uh, 30 watts of plate dissipation. We also know that 70% is really preferable, which would put it up around 21 watts. Now, since I have my bias pot maxed out, to get this sort of marginal plate dissipation, I'm going to lower the value of the 22K resistor down to 15K, and then I can send more of my uh, negative DC to ground and less of it to the grids, and I should be able to boost my plate dissipation a little bit higher. Okay, so. Uh, let's install the uh, 15K resistor and see uh, how it turns out. Okay, we'll take the amp off standby. And remember our tubes are set at minimum bias. Let's crank them up now and see if we can get closer to the elusive 21 watt ideal settings for this circuit. Let's see, that looks pretty good right there. Okay, let me write down these values and calculate the plate dissipation. Well, this looks ideal to me. Here are the values for plate current for the two tubes, plate voltage, plate dissipation, and the mean plate dissipation is 20.7 watts, which is right at 70% of the 30 watt uh, maximum for uh, these tubes. Okay, so I'm going to leave it at this setting. I'm very pleased with it. And uh, let's continue then with our audio test. Let's take a little break from the sweltering workshop and go out into the sweltering driveway for a quick uh, walk around tour of uh, my latest uh, hot rod. This is a 1932 Ford. It's an all metal steel body on a Pete and Jake's frame. Uh, most of what you see I have changed on it um, except for maybe the windshield and the top. So let's uh, start our tour. Uh, let's go over to the side. I changed the wheels and tires and put on the great big fat rear tires and the small fronts which is the kind of standard procedure uh, these are both 15 inch the fronts are around 5 inches wide the rear are 10 inches wide but the tires overall are about 13 inches wide so you get quite a contrast front to rear and that's the way I like it uh, these are Krager um, Street Pro wheels, they look a lot like old Halibrands. You see, you see that we have the uh, four bar suspension in the front and in the rear. It's not totally traditional, but the beauty of it is that it uh, preserves the uh, amount of caster that you have as the wheel moves up and down instead of sweeping through an arc, in which case the caster would vary during its travel through the arc. The caster remains the same because the wheel moves straight up and down. Okay, it has what we call commercial headlights. These are actually off of a truck um, back in the uh, early 30s. So they're large diameter and they're probably the most popular type of headlight uh, that you can pick on these. Um, I changed the whole front suspension. The I put in uh, this uh, I-beam drilled chromed 4-inch drop axle, a brand new spring that uses Teflon to lubricate between the leaves of the spring so that it uh, suspends very smoothly. We have adjustable ride tech shocks and uh, I 
uh, I had to change the spreader bar on the front because it came with a really large diameter big v-shaped one and it looks sort of like a snowplow and I posted a video showing how I made this replacement it's polished stainless steel with aluminum brackets and uh, I just think that just looks a whole lot better and I also recently installed these finned uh, brake disc covers with the scoops to kind of I don't know just as a nice finishing touch I think the uh, hubs and spindles I left uh, in yellow so that there was some contrast I think if you get just everything is just solid chrome you lose your sensitivity to the chrome uh, in this case a uh, little bit of uh, color variations here to pep things up okay and I uh, also got the original Ford style radiator cap and emblem to add a little shininess something attractive on the front end when I got the car it had no side covers for the hood and to me that that's okay I guess uh, but it just if you really want a nice smooth clean refined car you need the side covers on the hood uh, so I ordered from Rootley these uh, with the kind of maximum size louvers for the best cooling which we need around here on these ungodly summers and um, I had to add metal to the ends of them so that I could get a nice uniform uh, line down there that uh, body separation line between the uh, side panel and the radiator and the cowl um, put in stainless steel handles I had to come up with a way to, to mount these so and I'm not sure if you can see it but there's an aluminum L-shaped uh, shelf it's it's a 90 degree aluminum shelf and the hood then can rest down on the shelf and then from underneath the uh, hood sides go up with pins and are located into it so it's very neat uh, really no exposed hinge um, and I d used uh, instead of latches I went with stainless steel uh, bolts that go into a sort of a subframe that I built in here so that the uh, side panel is held very securely it's got the uh, classic 32 Ford windshield which can tilt out and also if you loosen uh, this wing nut can lay down um, the top does not fold up it's uh, a top made by Sid Shavers it's got a steel tubular framework in here that supports it uh, and if you want to remove the top it's a matter of two bolts one on each side and uh, couple wing nuts you see them up here so you can have the top off you need help doing it but you can get the top off in probably a uh, minute or minute and a half all right let's move around to the rear uh, got the 39 Ford tail lights and uh, a spreader bar that matches the one in the front now, I didn't make this it came with it uh, let me uh, open the hood for you or the trunk I should say or the bonnet as you English people say and just take a look at how nicely finished it is okay here we go it's got the uh, hydraulic uh, cylinders down here that control the rate of rise and fall and uh, custom carpet and side panels let me uh, crawl underneath here in the back and show you the differential and the rear suspension before I go crawling underneath I wanted to show you uh, I thought the rear uh, frame horns here were a little plain and also they just stopped right here it seemed unfinished so I made aluminum sort of a, a base plate for the a bolt heads and I fabricated a semicircle here to complete the curvature of the frame horn around the nuts that are holding the spreader bar okay we're underneath uh, car has four-wheel disc brakes and uh, 
QA1 adjustable coilovers. It's got a Curie 9 inch rear dif differential, all uh, just beautifully painted and buffed out. And the car came that way. I didn't do it, but I did install this finned aluminum rear cover just to kind of pep things up. There's a little too much yellow back there. Uh, the exhaust system has uh, some good mufflers, but still rather noisy. And I kind of truncated the exhaust here rather than sweeping up under the gas tank where from the side they're just so blatantly obvious. I kind of like it. Sort of uh, shortened abbreviated exhaust um, and as you'll see when we start it up it, it does make its presence known. I don't know how far you can see up ahead but everything, the uh, engine block, the transmission, everything has been detailed uh, in the same paint as in the body. You can see the upper uh, four bar that's controlling the uh, up and down travel on the rear differential. I'm squirming a bit because I'm being eaten alive by ants as I lay here on the 400 degree asphalt. But uh, let's get back up and take a look at the other side. Okay, this side you'll see looks remarkably like the other one. Um, I had to repaint the entire car. It looked pretty darn good till you got it out in the sun and it turns out that they originally painted the car apart. Uh, each of the panels, the doors, the hood, everything were painted uh, separately and then when they put it all together it was like a, a checkerboard. In the in sunlight you could see that they were there was just a distinct difference in, in color and, and hue and all uh, between the different panels. So. I had to spring for a complete paint job. The color is um, Velocity Yellow Pearl. And I, if you want to have a yellow, that's it right there as, as far as I'm concerned. Let me get down here on the, on the ant strewn pavement and we'll take a closer look at the front suspension. Okay, we're down here checking out the uh, front suspension pretty much on its level. As you can see, those fin disc covers pretty snazzy uh, with the scoop so that you get some air in there to cool the disc. Um, I had to clean the bugs off the spreader bar and the uh, I beam front axle. See where that Teflon lubricated spring ties in right here. Nice. Uh, braided steel uh, conduits going up to the commercial headlights. Looks pretty tall from this vantage point. Okay, the weather's starting to change on us. It uh, looks like it's going to rain, so I th let's do a quick walk around at a little distance so you can kind of get an overall view of the car. And uh, what I'll do in the next video is uh, Pull the hood sides, expose the engine, and we'll start it up and go for a ride. Okay, so that'll give you something to look forward to. So let me stand up and do our final little uh, pass around the car. Okay, here's our walk around from a little distance where you can get a better grasp of the how the car looks in its entirety. The interior is black leather. The seat backs uh, recline. Uh, it's got a bench seat in the front. I made the um, brushed aluminum instrument panel to match the column drop and the steering column. Leather wrapped wheel. I put in uh, some indicator lights for my turn signals and for the high beam in the middle is the blue light pedal uh, parts are painted to match the car and very cozy rides firm but pretty darn comfortably and as you'll see in the next video when we go for a ride uh, horrendously fast it's a stroked 350 so it's a 383 with about 10 and a half to 1 compression and a very radical a roller solid lifter cam. 
So it sounds just fantastic. Sounds like a drag race car and runs like one too. Uh, at first I thought that might not be good. You know, I might end up getting in trouble. Um, but no, <laughs> trust me, it works out just great. Okay, so that's what's been keeping me busy for the last, on and off for the last year. Okay, and it's pretty well finished now. So I hope you enjoyed the tour and that you'll uh, tune in for a subsequent video in which we check out the engine and go for a ride. Until then, thanks for watching. Bye for now. Before we begin our audio demonstration, I think it's important that we discuss a very special feature that this amp has, and that is the presence control. Now, a lot of people absolutely love this control, and what's odd is that if Fender does not include it on some of their more famous basement circuits. The uh, AA 864 doesn't have it. Okay, so let's take a good look at how this control is uh, configured, how it functions, and maybe uh, try to understand uh, why it is so popular. First off, it is simply an extension of the NFB loop you can see the loop comes down here and then extends to ground and the presence control consists of a 4700 ohm resistor in parallel with a 0.1 microfarad cap that also has a 25k linear taper um, potentiometer in series with the capacitor. Now those of you who see this I think uh, would recognize this as a uh, filter for particular frequencies. Uh, in just a few minutes we'll determine what those frequencies are. But first let's discuss how an NFB loop works and that will help us to understand how the presence control functions. We're going to send a portion of the output signal from the secondary of our output transformer back through a limiting resistor, in this case it's 56K, and we will understand more about why that resistor is important in just a second. Signal continues and goes through more resistance and then enters the cathode of the long tail pair phase inverter. Now here's the catch that makes the NFB a loop work. The phase of the signal at this point is opposite of the phase of the signal being fed into the long tail pair phase inverter. Now if this NFB signal were not attenuated significantly by the limiting resistor and came down here at full uh, amplitude and entered the phase inverter it would essentially neutralize all of the uh, equal but out of phase uh, frequencies found in the input signal. Okay, but, and that's what you don't want, that would be essentially like a mute. So instead, because of this significant attenuation, the um, frequencies uh, being fed in here will only partially neutralize the frequencies in the input signal. Why is this a good thing? Because it tames the amplifier, it uh, greatly increases uh, cleans, uh, increases your headroom, um, and it reduces noise. So it is very beneficial if you want your amplifier to behave in a civilized fashion. If you don't, that's what my switchable NFB loop toggle is all about. Let's get back to the presence control. But let's add a special touch to this by eliminating some of the frequencies in the feedback signal that we don't want to cancel. And that's what the presence control is for. By sending selected frequencies based on the uh, relationship between this resistor, capacitor, and the adjustment of that pot, 
certain frequencies will be taken out of the feedback signal and sent to ground and will not go in here to neutralize the uh, input signal from the preamp and therefore those selected frequencies will be portrayed to a higher degree in our output signal. Okay, just a quick review. If we don't neutralize those frequencies at the phase inverter, they will continue through unabated while all other frequencies that weren't filtered out to ground will be uh, attenuated somewhat because of the out of phase condition of the NFB signal. Now because of the fact that it is an extension of the NFB circuit, we will have to have the NFB switch in the on position for the presence uh, control to function. Now what frequencies uh, are going to be sent to ground? What frequencies does the fender presence control affect? Now I've heard all sorts of speculation about the frequencies affected by the fender presence control and I've set up an experiment here where we will not only determine the exact frequency at which the presence control begins to function but we'll also be able to hear what that frequency sounds like. I'm going to input uh, a signal into the basement amp, uh, have the NFB loop on and what I will do is as I'm fluctuating and sweeping the presence control from maximum to minimum will increase the frequency of the input signal until we can hear fluctuation in that signal meaning that the presence control is actually uh, modulating it. Now for some of you who are sensitive to high pitched frequencies uh, you might want to uh, either turn down your speaker or headphones or fast forward ahead to the end of the experiment. For the rest of us, uh, sit tight and let's completely uh, try to demystify the presence control. Okay, here we are at 30 cycles per second, okay, extreme bass frequency. Here's a sweep of the presence control and I don't hear any modulation. Let's go up to 100 cycles per second. Again, nothing. Okay, now let's jump up to 1,000 cycles per second. Listen closely. of like 9 or 10. Okay, so the presence control has just begun to have effect at a thousand cycles per second and it's actually fairly high pitched. Now let's move up to uh, 2,000 cycles per second. Okay, 2,000 cycles per second. Very high pitched to my ears. Here goes the sweep of the presence control. More noticeable effect. That began at about 7. Now let's go up to 3,000 cycles per second. Wow. Huge effect. Okay, so uh, without belaboring the point uh, any longer, it seems to me like the presence control begins at about a thousand cycles per second and continues up to really reach its uh, sort of peak modulation capability at around 3,000 cycles per second. So it's definitely the lower end of the high frequency range or I guess we could say the high end of mid-range. So I hope that uh, answers some questions uh, and I think now we're ready to uh, get Jack and Ollie out here and fire up the old basement and play some tunes and in one of those tunes 
I will sweep the presence control from minimum to maximum back and forth several times during the tune and I think you'll be able to tell very easily while I'm, when I'm doing it and also if you look at the audio spectrum which will be on the screen I think you'll see where the uh, enhanced or increased uh, amount of signal is being sent uh, to the output tubes. Okay, so without further ado, let's get started. Here's our traditional audio demo setup. The Shure M57 microphone aimed at our 12-inch Jensen speaker. Uh, we will be inputting tunes from a very special guitar, which I'll show you after the audio demo, uh, and it will be uh, strummed by Ollie and Jack uh, for your listening pleasure. Okay, we have plugged into the AC wall outlet so that our amp is receiving full 120 volts uh, and current, proper current, and uh, we have our tubes uh, biased at uh, about 20 to 21 watts of plate dissipation, which is at 70% of max. So, let's get started.
I thought you might get a kick out of the guitar we used in today's audio demo. Um, Jack and Ollie uh, were talking with Mitzi, and it turns out our latest feral cat has a whole locker full of just fabulous vintage instruments. And she decided to share this one with us today for our audio demonstration. So it's a 1964 uh, Gibson SG. Uh, junior in absolutely mint original shape. Every nut, bolt, and screw is original, and uh, I hope that uh, it does us justice here in today's audio demonstration. Well, I guess that's about it uh, for this video on the mighty 1962 or 3 6 G6A Fender Basement Amplifier. I hope you uh, enjoyed the sort of special features on the presence control and the creation of the adjustable bias pot. And I'd like to take a few moments to thank the people who are keeping us on the air, namely our Patreon patrons and PayPal contributors. Without them, uh, these videos uh, would not be available. If you would like to uh, join them in supporting our channel, which incidentally uh, receives no revenue whatsoever from advertising simply because I hate ads in videos. Um, you can do so if you simply look at the links that I will place in the video description. Before you ask any questions or make any corrections to what you've seen, please check uh, the list of comments and corrections which I will place at the very top of the comment section to be sure that it hasn't already been addressed there. And before uh, we sign off, I just want to leave you with a little teaser for our next uh, video and it will be a real change of pace from the amplifier repair uh, style of videos. Uh, and I'm only going to give you a couple hints here. Number one will be the word scratch built and number two will be supero. So if that sounds at all enticing, please stay tuned because uh, we'll be back with uh, new videos uh, in the near future. Until then, please stay happy and healthy and by all means, stay tuned. Bye for now. After all the moaning and groaning about the ungodly heat uh, that we've been suffering with this uh, summer, with temperatures averaging probably above 105 degrees, uh, all of a sudden, We've got just a beautiful day, heavily overcast, and a light rain is falling, and I think it's about 82 degrees, which is about 30 degrees below what we've become accustomed to. So I just thought I'd share it with you.